Before we begin, a bit of disclosure. I have had creators involved with both projects, if indirectly in one case, on my show in the past. Now this will not play a factor as always, but I feel I should point this out. I'd say my takes on both of these games are not going to make any friends, but when has that stopped me before? Hello there ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildra, and I am your Gaming Monk for the evening. Now, the concept of a hack in role-playing games is interesting. In summation, it is a large overhauling of a given rule set to either emulate a new style, genre, or something in between. A video game example would be the total overhaul Arma mods in order to turn Arma into its own version of Warhammer 40,000. Now, this is far from a new concept, as the story of dissatisfaction with the rule set becoming its own game is a story as old as the hobby. To give a few examples, Chivalry and Sorcery was created in response to dissatisfaction about the historical aspect of Dungeons and Dragons. The game that would later become Rollmaster started its life as Arms Law, a collection of house rules for advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Fantasy Craft is both a fantasy take on Crafty Kane's previous works by Craft, as well as a massive overhaul of D&D 3rd Edition's rule set. 13th Age, previously reviewed, as well as Fantasy Craft, developed by Heinzo and Tweet, is a combination of elements present in D&D 3rd and 4th edition. That's not getting into the retro clones that attempt to be cleaned up spiritual successes of past games. DWD's Frontier Space and Covert Ops are successes to Star Frontiers and Top Secret, respectively. The Saga Machine system, used in Shadows Over Soul and Against the Dark Yogi, is heavily inspired by the Saga system used in Dragonlance 5th Age and Marvel Adventure game. Most recently, Ascendant, the previously reviewed one, is a combination of elements between Marvel Phase Rip and the DC Heroes RPG. The point is that the concept of overhauling is nothing new. And about two years ago, I predicted that it was only a matter of time before someone did this with 5th edition. But why would one do that? 5th edition is the world's greatest role-playing game, I hear some ask while clutching their core books they got signed by Mike Merles. I kid, I kid. But permit me a moment to do the monkly thing and enlighten you by speaking a few things that some will find... blasphemous. Just remember, I am a monk, and one of my vows is to always tell the truth. You see, the supposed world's greatest role-playing game ain't as great as some people would like me to think. I realize some folks might want to get out the pitchforks and torches for my statement. To that I say, best luck keeping the torches warm during Fimble Winter, where everything's cold. But, hyperbole aside, there's several issues I've had with the design from Merles and Crawford. In no particular order, these are... 1. Subclasses being the sole customization for most characters, and not making them unique enough from other subclasses in the same class. Attempting to emulate the class packages from AD&D or Pathfinder, whilst failing to understand either. 2. An overabundance of spell bloat and the concentration rule that makes haste an absolute must in addition to making many utility spells having far too specific use of that limited spell pool, thus relegating them to the Rainy Day Paradox, or the 99 Megalixers Paradox. 3. Feats being an alternative to ability score improvement misses the points of feats as a means of personalization, and several feats within the books feel either unnecessary to a particular build or useless, with very little in between. 4. A lack of support for high levels as well as inconsistent strengths at high level and capstone features that are equally inconsistent. Combine this with the ridiculous means in which short rests and long rests are utilized by abilities contributes to a narrative that playing after 10th level is boring. And lastly, using advantage as a substitute for improvement. With these issues and more, it's only natural that someone would attempt to overhaul the system on their own. Originally, I coined this as a 5.5 edition, but as time has gone on, I don't think that's quite accurate. Now this is where our subject matters come in. Level Up 5e and Heavens and Heresies. Both of these have been covered in detail on this channel through the Valley of the Judge series, and I've had my talks with both ends of this affair. Now in this little video, I'll be comparing both of these 5e reduxes, these 20-sided remixes, and these polyhedral remasters. If you'll forgive me for ripping off Guru Larry. I will note, however, that I'm not comparing who's better as I leave the dick-measuring contest to political activists and other perpetually online folks. But rather, how well each reflects the follow-through on what they pitched. With the shenanigans out of the way, let's roll up our sleeves and get to it, shall we? I'd like to start with the design goals, the supposed philosophies that underpin everything you're going to be seeing in the respective works. This will also be our measuring stick for how well they follow through on the proverbial sales pitch. The Level Up 5e Kickstarter listed a dozen or so bullet points, 
But there's three concepts that I heard use frequently. The first was adding depth, but not complexity. This isn't fully elaborated on, as there's a lot of ways those words could be taken, but it seems that the focus was expanding the possibilities of the rule set while still being compatible with them. The other was referred to as steal what you want, i.e. you can dip into its materials as you wish, it being fully compatible with Core 5e. Lastly, it aims for a three-pronged design of combat, exploration, and social mechanics. Heavens and Heresies, on the other hand, defines its philosophy early on by two pillars, tactical play and what it calls the myth of self-sufficiency. In the former's case, this is elaborated on early in a segment called A Defense of Tactical Play, which intends to address the popular misconception that mechanics and role-playing are mutually exclusive. Within that same section is the aforementioned myth. The idea behind this is that no participant is an island, and all the mechanics are designed to emphasize team play. Every character and monster is meant to have some manner of supporting their allies. Now both games still use the same core D20 mechanic, but they do add their own batch of monkey wrenches into the sandbox. In Level Up's case, the core concept I want to focus on here is what it does with the inspiration mechanic. This was always something I felt was a little undercooked in 5e. In Level Up, characters choose a destiny at the start, which grants inspiration when performing certain actions, as well as a feature benefit when you fulfill said destiny. Not too far removed from Star Wars Saga Edition. Let's use Excellence as one example. When choosing this destiny, you gain inspiration from failure via natural ones, and fulfill your destiny when you perform a crowning achievement. Heavens and Heresies does not have inspiration, but each class has a mechanic called Raising the Death Flag. This is a very overpowered ability, to the point where it resulted in a what-the-fuck reaction from Xan during the Valley of the Judge, and this restores everyone's health and provides a class-centric feature that makes one very powerful. The catch is that at the end of the scene which you use it, your character dies, and your replacement cannot use that same race and class combination. For example, a fighter who raises the death flag raises their HP to full along with their allies, gains 15 feet of extra movement, their attack and move commands do not use reactions, they may rally more than one ally per round, and they gain an extra attack. This means they can potentially use their command ability three times per round without having to worry about using their reactions. Inspiration is nice, but it's something that could lead into the enforced behavior problem that occurs with alignment in past editions. Looking right at you, Paladin, with your rules mandated justification to be a complete dickhead. I haven't forgotten how dumb those fall rules were, and I refuse to let anyone forget, ever. The Death Flag might not get all that much use depending on the campaign, but I like how it provides a more dramatic exit than a few death saves. And I do love drama. I've never been the biggest fan of skills in D&D as a whole, and I maintain that it will always be awkward when they're present because the game was never designed from them from the get-go. But if I have to tolerate them, I will merely state that the two-tier setup in 5e relies on heavy amounts of specialization, especially when untrained use is penalized. Level Up addresses this with an expertise die that steps up with each stack, up to d20. However, if someone has an expertise die of, say, d12, and they still roll a 1, well, that's not going to feel like they improved at all. Remember, folks, the dice gods have no mercy, and they hate you. In this regard, one would think I'd have issues with the fact that Heavens and Heresies' expertise tiers are just static number modifiers. However, I don't, because it's a level of improvement that people will be able to feel like they're getting better in some way, whatever that skill check. Of course, I'd also be remiss if I didn't point out that skills are not directly linked to one attribute, as well as the fact that you're not penalized for not having a skill. Yes, I know it's heritage or ancestry. Old habits die hard, so deal with it. Races have a bit of a reputation of not mattering as much. While leveling up, it's a few movements of numbers and a feature you won't use all that much. Obviously, both have their ways of addressing this. Level Up expands this into the form of Origin, whose four pillars are Heritage, i.e. Race, Culture, where you'd grow up, Background, your occupation, and Destiny, which we've already talked about. Your Heritage tends to grant a set of shared traits, as well as one gift out of the gate. Additionally, you gain one Paragon gift at 10th level. However, a lot of the gifts and Paragons come across as doubling and shifting racial gifts of the past. It doesn't help that a lot of the benefits can be summarized as gain an expertise die to X. This will be a thing later. In Heavens and Heresies, by contrast, race is significantly more important. It determines your starting hit points, your proficiency modifier, your ability score array, and your ability defenses. 
You also gain a feat at first level, with an additional one at every fourth level, as well as an ability score improvement at third, seventh, eleventh, and fifteenth level, with some restrictions. Yes, you don't have to choose between ASI and feats, meaning you don't have to deal with one of the dumber decisions from 5e. I appreciate seeing proper customizations again. Ah, classes. The be-all, end-all of characters. In 5e, there's been an issue of class kits being meant to be played as instead of with. That is to say, there's very little opportunity to personalize with many class-subclass combinations. Obviously, there's different ways this is handled, but instead of going through each class individually, which would be tricky as the parallels aren't exactly one-to-one, -one, I'd instead like to focus on the class structure. Level Up 5e, much like 5e Prime, has a questionable structure between the classes. It's very all over the place. I recall one person saying that everyone is just a warlock, and while I don't completely agree with that, I can certainly see it with the pool of features every class gains. Soldiering knacks for fighters, developed talents for berserkers, elective studies for wizards, and so on. Unfortunately, so many of these feel like feats in all but name, or have restrictions that are a bit arbitrary for what they grant. In a few worse cases, it's just an expertise die to X again, or similar moving of numbers. In some classes' case, there is an implication of a 20-level narrative arc, but this is hardly consistent. Oh yeah, and it's using the same spell system, so all my burning hatred of Vancey and magic still applies, as much as my annoyance with the once-per-short-or-long-rest methods of recovery throughout a lot of this. That said, Level Up attempts to introduce maneuvers a la the Book of Nine Swords. You know, the book that made so many grognars act like idiots because, god forbid, people draw inspiration from things that aren't Tolkien-esque. But I digress. Each martial class has access to certain maneuver groups, known as traditions, and some maneuvers may be enhanced through exertion. You'd think I'd be all over this, but it's basically key powers in all but name. Plenty of them reflect upon a tradition's theme, but I'd hesitate to call the themes evocative. Also, the book doesn't provide a chart so I can see what class has access to what traditions. Shame. Heavens and Heresies has a bit more structure to its application. For starters, the core ability requirements denote what ability scores are a good idea to prioritize as they'll be getting use within the class. It's also worth noting that instead of hit die, classes in H&H &H have vitality, which can work like hit die in healing you, but also recover features by pushing forward or activate magic items. The dividing line between the martial and magical classes is that the former is able to use vitality more efficiently since they recover vitality after using it. However, this is not universal, as some will gain extra vitality from leveling up instead of a more effective usage. Beyond that, each class grants a set of features that reinforces a theme that every class fundamentally changes the way a session may be played. I'd also like to take this time to mention that spells use a spell point system, recovering these points with rests and vitality use. Casting the basic version of a spell is free, but spell points may be used to increase damage, range, inflict conditions, or change the area of effect. Most of the indirect spells have been moved over into rituals, meaning anyone can utilize them if they're proficient. Bottom line, what differentiates casting classes isn't available spells, but how they utilize the combination of spell points, spell point recovery, spells known, and the cap for spell point use on a single spell. Ah, feats. The personalization that wizards completely missed the point on, as mentioned before. As I mentioned earlier, the purpose of feats when they are introduced was to allow for a degree of personalization beyond your choice of race and class, as well as skills and spells for the casters. Dear god, the spell list back then. Granted, back in 3rd edition they got a little bit out of hand, but treating them as an alternative to ability score improvement carries the implication that the designers are deathly afraid of people wandering off their beaten path. Again, characters seem to be made to be played as and not with. Level Up tries to mitigate this with what I call feat likes, i.e. feats in all but name. I already mentioned some of them when I was talking about class design, and exploration knacks also fall under this. Because feats have a connotation, there exists this needs for a similar but not quite affair. Essentially, it's not too far removed from the talent system that was frequent within Pathfinder 1st Edition. Heavens and Heresies, meanwhile, has feats in a more traditional use, but it's reminiscent of fantasy craft for a couple reasons. First, feats are fairly light in prerequisites, most of the time being only based in core abilities or proficiencies. Second, each feat is placed into their own category. These categories are General, Martial, Spell and Ritual, and Ancestry. Additionally, feats aren't limited to class, as several classes gain feats in certain categories. 
And of course, there's little in the way of you gain advantage on X. While advantage can come into play, it's a far more active situation. As an experiment to see what both games offer insofar as character creation, I decided to do a little experiment using Good Brother TJ's 5e character, Renard Perdu, a tiefling with six levels in Gloomstalker Ranger, with three levels in Champion Fighter. I don't want to go into the character creation process point by point as I've done in other Versus videos because that would distract from the point I'm trying to make here. What I do wish to do is use this as an experiment on compatibility. Now regardless, I operated under the assumption that for the former it'd be Ranger 6 and Fighter 3 using only the subclasses in the book, and for the latter it'd be a 9th level Failborn Ranger. The reason for my decision in the former is because of the still what you want bullet point that was brought up during the Kickstarter. With Level Up 5e, the tricky part really comes in the form of converting subclasses. See, Rangers in 5e aren't inherent spellcasters, and the only subclass that grants it is Wildborn, which uses the Druid spell list. This means that the Gloomstalker doesn't have the same compatibility unless I house rule the Druid list to allow for Ranger Conclaves. Granted, it could be argued that many of the combat abilities granted by the Gloomstalker are relegated to maneuvers, but I don't buy that for a moment. There's also the fact that the fighter levels don't grant second wind as quickly. Also, exploration knacks are going to be a territory without a clear parallel, and the feat setup is significantly undercut due to several feats being moved into other avenues. For a game that boasts compatibility with core, it certainly isn't showing it in the way character creation works. This would be easier if there was a conversion guide, but to my recollection I haven't seen one. And no, just house ruling it is not an acceptable answer. That's a bandage and it always will be. Ironically, Heavens and Heresies gave me an easier time, despite some features not being as compatible or not having a parallel. I really only had to cheat when it came to the fighter features, which I made as talismans, a generic kind of magic item since magic items are your multi-classing option. The ability scores weren't able to completely match up because of how ASI works, alongside feats instead of mutual exclusivity and the fact that starting ability scores are something assigned rather than rolled. But the feel of a darkness-leaning ranger that preferred a bow to a blade was able to come through. In some ways, the kit featured here makes the character more of a threat, especially with how rangers treat terrain in the sense that they don't have a favored terrain that they pick, they just have benefits depending on the terrain that they're in, as well as how fighters treat second win, where instead of an extra bit of dice, it grants you more HP when you're at 5 and recover HP or gain temporary HP. And of course, the push forward rule that Heavens and Heresies has allows for ability to be used without worrying about rests, up to a point, you're still spending vitality to do it. I know I've done a fair bit of picking on level up 5e in this, as well as when I covered the playtest on Valley of the Judged. On its own, it's an alright spin adding more to D&D 5e, even though some of the choices in design leave me puzzled. Also, 25 bucks for each of the three core books is a little bit much, in my opinion. The reason I added the value of follow-through onto the title of this video is because I wanted to highlight a major theme that was central to both their appearance in Valley of the Judged, as well as my own love of contrast. See, when D&D 5e was being playtested, the phrase Uniting of the Editions was something that I heard frequently, with the implication that it was the design pillar they intended to build around, while somehow wanting to be as accessible as possible. This is something I've made clear over the years is a war on two fronts, because diverse playstyles represented in D&D over the years have led to multiple camps that will not see eye to eye. You need to pick a lane and follow it. I also maintain my comparison from years ago that the idea of a greatest hits of the editions not only leaves no room to expand into new approaches, but also uses that collection of design ideas without an understanding of their context. Now I bring all this up because Level Up's goal of adding depth, not complexity, while maintaining compatibility is admirable, but it's one that will haunt you if you cannot live up to it. It seems to me that the aforementioned design pillars are a question that is answered with add more of everything. A three-pronged design! that creates three subsystems which are segregated from each other. More choices in classes, that are inconsistent in value. More actions, with the same restrictive action economy. Instead of refining the choices present, there were choices made that not only muddy the design waters, but undermine the touted compatibility, since it's only compatible to a point. In a weird way, it reminds me of Halo 5, which boasted more in its battle cry. But that more turned into the form of samey maps, enemies that don't challenge, and a boss fight that is repeated far too often to justify itself. 
Despite Heavens and Heresies still being an early access, it has remained far more consistent in its design goals. While it doesn't have the sheer size of choices, each choice matters, and there's little area to overwhelm players. The tactical play is not in adding more options, but giving you a set of choices within limited resources, be it vitality, movement, actions, or spell usage. Additionally, while there are some new mechanics, they aren't divorced from each other, and each play into the combined sandbox. Interplay is a major factor with individual characters and the combined whole. I haven't covered monster design yet because that is not finished at the time of this recording, but I may come to that down the road. I guess if there's any lesson from this, it's important to have a singular vision throughout a game's design. It's something I've tried to maintain in my own work. Too many cooks spoil the broth. Stay frosty!